Trish. And I'm Butch. And welcome to the very first episode of Dulcimer Road. Dulcimer Road is a monthly walk through the highways and byways of the Dulcimer community. Whether you play the mountain dulcimer, or the hammer, or any other instrument that's related to the dulcimer community. Out on our baby. It's about music, it's about people, it's about tab. Not so much about tab. It'll be a little tab. We're going to tell you where we've been. It's sultry. <laughs> we're going to tell you where we've been, we're going to tell you where we're going, and we're going to talk about the people who make this community so wonderful. In other words, it's going to be about you. But since this is our first episode, we thought we would actually talk about us. Uh, where we've been, especially in the last year, and uh, some of the people we've got to meet, and of course our favorite Dulcimer players. Dulcimer Road is going to let us take you with us. We're going to take you to festivals and jams, we're going to include you in house concerts, we're going to let you know about live events. Like the Christmas show we did back in December. Yes, which you can see live online. Every month we're going to take a few minutes where I explain a technique or maybe a fiddle song, something that will make you a better Dulcimer player. It's called Do Try This at Home. Let's take a look at one right now. Hey, it's Butch here at Butch Ross headquarters and I'm going to talk to you today about how to change strings. Probably the first thing we should do is talk about the different kind of strings that there are and the tools that you're going to need to do it. When it comes to steel strings, there are really only four different kinds. There's a straight, standard, unwound steel string like I'm holding in my hand. And then, uh, and then this is your, your standard middle string or melody string on a dulcimer. Then the other kind of strings are all wound around a steel string core like that one. This is nickel steel. And then there are two kinds that you can get that are um, essentially brass. There's an 80-20, what they call an 80-20 bronze, which is a bright brass colored, uh, again, wrapped around a steel core. And then there's the phosphor bronze, which I'm holding in my hand. Now this is a darker and a little more reddish in color, but it's basically the same as the 80-20. The 80-20 strings are a little cheaper than the phosphor bronze, but I think that the phosphor bronze have a darker and mellower tone, and uh, and I like, I those are my preferences. Of course, we're really just talking about the low end of the instrument, so it doesn't really matter because we don't play an instrument that has a lot of low end. One thing I will advise against you is to use the nickel string for your wound string. Um, these are really intended for like electric guitars and, and instruments that have magnetic pickups. They have a much brighter, thinner sound than um, most instrument, most of the, the bronze strings will give you. And I just don't think they sound particularly good on a mountain dulcimer. As far as the tools you're going to need, uh, most importantly you're going to need a string winder. Now Dunlap makes one, I think it's orange, it comes in different colors actually. Uh, that's pretty good. But this one I think is made by Kona. I can't really read the logo. Um, bought this off of Gary Sager at oh, the Ohio Valley Gathering and I happen to really like this particular brand because there's no friction has just been the thing and, and that's going to be important once we get into this. Uh, for those of you who have a slot head, you're probably going to need a set of clippers. Uh, these are actually way too big for the job but they'll get the job done. And except for the string liner, you probably have the tools you need lying around the house already. And then the other thing that you may need is a set of needle nose pliers. And this is strictly for people who use loop end strings and I'll show you how to use this in uh, just a little bit. All right, I'm gonna start by changing the middle string on a slot head McSpadden. I chose this McSpadden of mine because it uses um, loop end strings and I use by, I only buy ball end strings. One's not better than the other, uh, it's just a personal preference and since I buy strings in bulk um, and I don't use this instrument very often, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to buy um, loop end strings specifically to be used on this one instrument. But many of you do use loop end strings and that's fine and some of you may find yourself in a pinch where you're at a store or something and you need a string and they don't have the ball ends. And I'm going to show you how to, you can work around that with this. But first, we're going to start by changing the string. So the first thing I want to do is I want to remove the string. Um, before I remove the string, I want you to take a very close look at, uh, at the way that these strings are wound. You notice that these two uh, wind clockwise, and these two are wound counterclockwise. Basically, they're coming from the inside out. Whenever you're dealing with a slot head uh, or a flat head type of pickup or headstock, that's exactly what you want to have happen. Really what you want is you want the strings to remain as straight as possible once they get past the nut. The straighter they are and the more uh, pronounced the, 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 the angle coming off the back side of it, uh, the better intonation you have, the better it'll stay in tune 
and things like that. So the first thing we're going to do right now is I'm just going to take the string winder and I'm going to use it to unwind the string. Uh, while I'm doing that, I want to talk to you about breaking strings. A lot of you don't like to change strings or even change tunings because you're afraid of breaking strings, especially when you're winding up. We all have that fear that we're going to wind it too far and it's going to snap and, and take out an eye or something. And while that is possible, it's actually very, very rare. Most of the time that you break strings, you will break a string detuning it and you'll break that string because the string was very, very old. And when the detuned string breaks, they have very little snap left in them. Uh, and they won't, you have very little chance of actually poking yourself in the eye. Um, if, you're, if you snap the string, uh, winding it, it's because you've overwound it by an, an extraordinarily large amount. And, uh, and again, that's something that's nearly impossible to do. Uh, and the way that you prevent doing that is you actually by changing strings one at a time. Um, guitar players will want to do it because they don't want to uh, the warp the neck, right? Our instrument doesn't have that problem. Neck warpage is never really an issue if you're a mountain dulcimer player. However, um, a lot of mountain dulcimers have uh, bridges that aren't glued down, floating floating bridges. And, uh, you know, if you own a Ron Ewing or a Warren May or a uh, Mike Clemmer or a um, Jerry Rockwell, a lot of those have bridges that, that move. And so if you change one string at a time, then you keep the bridge where it needs to be and then you don't worry about you don't have to worry about intonation or marking it with a pencil and figuring out where to put it back on but just to be on the safe side i think it's best especially if you're doing this for the first time just to change one string at a time now like i said this is um this instrument is set up to take loop end strings and i only have ball ends there's two ways that you can if you have an instrument like that as well and you only have access to ball ends there's two things that you can do one is the ball end all has a little hole on the side of it. I don't know if you can see that. Take the tip of the string, push it through the hole, and then you create a little loop. And then you can you can really, really, and then just you got to tighten that loop up. Um, you have to tune and retune and retune because, it, because you're going to have to really get that thing to sink into place. What I do, or what I prefer to do, is this. So I'm going to take my needle nose pliers. I'm making sure I'm using the flat part, the, the part that doesn't have any grit in it. And I'm just going to put the string in there, like that, and squeeze. Until I, until I break. So I'm going to squeeze it, and then I'm going to squeeze it in the other direction. Now at this point, I've broken it by making it flat. So I can just snap that out. And now I'm left with a ball and string. I'm putting it on the end. I'm following it up the path. So the groove that goes around the top of it, the groove that goes around the end block, I mean, the groove here in the nut, uh, right here, which is for the middle string, and all of that. I'm going to follow that all the way through uh, as best I can, and I'm going to pull it through the center of the headstock, through the hole in the headstock, and looping it up. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it all the way in. I'm going to make sure I don't bend anything but I want to get the string, as much string on here as is humanly possible. Now what I like to do is take three fingers, pull them under the strings, and then I'm going to pull that string back until I got about three finger height, okay? Then what I'm going to do is use my middle ring and pinky to hold the string and my index finger to hold the string down. So I'm pulling up here, but I'm pushing down here at the same time. And then, well, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is, is before I do that, is I'm going to make sure i got enough slack that I can take the string and I can wrap it around the headstock once. So I've wrapped it going in this direction, which is the same direction as I'm going to turn it, so that it, and, and then it's going, it's coming out of the string and it's going around the, the post, but it's above the ec the extra, the bit that's hanging out. So it's actually above it. Now I'm going to pull up and push down. And I'm, my finger is in the middle slot. I'm pushing down to keep it taut. And I'm pulling up to keep the string tense. This keeps it from slipping off the back uh, and, and falling out. Now as I wind this string, I'm going to make sure, and I don't know that you can see this with the camera, but I'm going to make sure that each subsequent string wrap goes under 
where that extra bit of string comes out. So, and then each turn after that happens after that happens after that. All right. So what I'm doing, what I did there with the with this part, is so you have the hole, right? And the string comes out of the hole. The string comes out of the hole. I then wrap it around so that the first wrap is on top of the string coming out of the hole. This is the string coming out of the hole. Then each wrap is underneath the one that comes before it like that. And I try to get three or four, leave enough slack that I can get three or four wraps around it. Hopefully you can see that. And the reason why I do that is that top rung around the top plus all the tension from the strings being pulled is actually holding it in place. That makes it tune faster, uh, get in tune faster, stay in tune better, and is also much less likely to break while you're retuning. Re and I need to finish. Once you get a little tension, I'm testing, I'm testing by, I'm playing the, new, the fourth fret and then tuning to get. All right. So I got it where I like it. This is DAC, by the way. Um, and, I, and I could use my clippers now at this point just to, to clip them off. But if you have a flat head, what I actually prefer to do is this. This is such a thing that you would do if you were a nine-year-old. But it works really, really well. Just grab the string and pull it all the way to one side and then grab it and pull it all the way to the other side. Back and forth and back until it just snaps off. The reason why you want to do it that way is that what happens is where that piece snaps off is exactly where it comes out uh, from the strings. So there's no way I can poke myself with the little bit of string. You see that? With the little bit of string that's sticking out, there's no way that I can poke myself. Another thing I like to do to help get it in tune, grab it and just give it a good twang. New strings can handle this, and a couple of times just gets all the kinks out, and you'll really be able to get it in tune and keep it in tune. Well, that's it for part one in our two-part series about how to change strings. Tune in next month when I'll show you how to change the strings on a scroll head dulcimer, and no, I won't say that name right either. Thanks for watching. month on Dulcimer Road, we're going to feature and talk to some Dulcimer players from all over the country. In fact, next month, we're going to be looking at some of the great Dulcimer players that live right here in Chattanooga. But we want to hear from you. Be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or email us your ideas, questions, or comments at dulcimerroad at gmail.com. This year has been a fabulous year. It's been chock full, and when we look back at pictures this week about all the things we had done and the places we've been, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And so much of that has involved you, and that's one of the reasons that we've loved doing it. It's been neat for me to be a part of it and go along with Butch and meet you and hear all the great dulcimer music um, that there is around the country. So some of the most fun things we've done this year have been house concerts. I like house concerts. All musicians. Uh, like house concerts. <laughs> What's great about house concerts is that you get to be up close and personal with your audience. And as an audience member, it's neat for me to be able to watch that happen. And um, what's so great is that the hosts are always so tremendous um, with their hospitality and, and having food and drink. And it's just such a, it's like, it's a party plus, And I love that. Um, I dig, the other thing I like about house concerts is the, kind of that breakdown of the fourth wall. You know, uh, when I started performing, I always dug the idea of the lights and the and the monitors and being on stage and the audience is, is out there. But it's it's actually a lot more fun to just be in a room. It's almost like you're having a conversation. Well, it is. It's so intimate. And I think people don't always get that experience. And for, you know, for performers, I, I just think it's a fantastic opportunity to, you know, I think be human in a way to your audience because they're so close to you. They get to see kind of the magic happening. Um, one of the most fun house concerts that we had this year, um, we got to feature one of our students, Ken Hicks. Ken Hicks, yeah. And um, Ken opened your house concert at the first annual 
Chattanooga Ukulele Festival. That's right. We uh, did the uh, Ukulele Festival here in Chattanooga up on Signal Mountain, and it was a uh, um, it was a uh, how, how many people were there? We had I want to say we had at least fifty people. Um, we had a jam on Friday night in my house and a chili dinner that was so exciting. We had people coming in with a um, with the bass ukulele and um, providing um, that support for brand new ukulele players. We had a, a piano player come in that's a friend of ours and start playing and so it was just a great time and then and then you taught all those great classes the next day. And then we had the house concert to kind of close out the night and uh, yeah it was a lot of fun. Yeah so it's, it's fun to be able to do something in our own backyard in our own home as it were. Um, Speaking of, we got to do the Chattanooga Dulcimer Festival this year, which we haven't hasn't happened in a couple of years, and that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Dan and Angie Landrum do such a good job at, at doing those, and we've known Dan and Angie for a long time, and they're pretty fabulous. We got to uh, we got to play along with um, Aaron O'Rourke, Steve Seifert, Katie Moritz, and Lisa Ferguson. Lisa Ferguson. And who will be um, on the show next month. That's right, she will. And so that was that was just great fun. I got to teach my first voice class at that Chattanooga Festival. That's right. So my all my great students uh, can sing The Lion Sleeps Tonight quite beautifully. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be teaching that at KMW this summer. Right? I will be teaching a little bit of voice at KMW. I'm really looking forward to that. So um, And that's your first time teaching it. That's right? my first time teaching there. I was able to go to KMW for the first time and take my, my little girl Ella, who had a great time. Uh, at the kids camp and we just enjoyed spending the week with great friends and meeting new ones and just the the energy and the the momentum that is Kentucky Music Week is pretty amazing you get to hear some of the best in the business as it were and just have a great time Kentucky Music Week is a, is a really is a once-in-a-lifetime experience except you get to do it every year I told my students is this is happening to me but I know that it happens to them too because we've had this conversation Years and years, and on Wednesday, on Wednesday, you you think, you think, why did I sign up? For? I'm never <laughs> doing this again. Right. And on Thursday, you're like, oh man, there's only one more day. <laughs> like it, it happens every year. I've been doing like this. Is my this is gonna be my tenth year, and it happens every single yeah, year. Yeah, it, it's just so um, great. And I can't fail to mention the theme days. Ella had a great time being a hippie and a zombie and whatnot, and and Nancy Barker just does a tremendous job putting this festival together every year. We're filming this, by the way, um, on a in the midst of a winter storm, That's and right. uh, and since um, and since it's icy, it's sleet. We're not sure what it's doing out there yet, um, but since it's really terrible weather today, I think we should definitely talk about the opportunity we had to go down to Florida. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, Florida is my home state. Um, I I lived there until college. And um, so we've had the opportunity, at least for two years, to go down to Florida and visit Tallahassee and do some house concerts there um, with um, Linda Linda, um, and Becky, and Becky down in Lakeland and the Farmer's Market in Lakeland, which is fantastic. And Tony Bees. And if you haven't been to Tony Bees, uh, you've got to get there in Lakeland. It's a, it's a wonderful wine bar and Tony um, does great music concerts there. Um, we also traveled down to St. Pete, which is my hometown, to play the Hideaway, which played the Hideaway, which is a mm -hmm. great little place, if great little it. venue, it's right? Uh, it's it's yeah, Central <laughs> Avenue, uh, Hideaway, yeah, again. And um, so, uh, if you're in St. Pete, you should check definitely check it out. Um, and so, all along the way, we've gotten to see friends like Bing and Sherry and Guy all, all along the the Florida route. So that's been fun. Yeah. And speaking of sunshine. We had an amazing opportunity to go out to California in yes. May. And uh, that started with a visit to San Francisco and all of the fun touristy things that San Francisco is. And then we made our way um, to San Mateo to be hosted by the one and only Steve Yulberg, who is just a doll. And, um, and a great dulcimer player as well. Not just a doll, he's a great dulcimer player as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Steve and Connie put up with put up with us for a couple of days. <laughs> put up with us is, I mean, <laughs> and, really, um, I mean, you can probably tell putting up with us is a key word. And they live in San Mateo, and we got to take day trips up into the city to do the touristy thing, and then we were at the, the uh, Berkeley Dulcimer Festival, which is an awesome festival held at the uh, Freight and Salvage 
Coffee House, which is a really awesome thing. It's really fantastic, and Deborah, Ham Deborah Hamrest did a great job putting all that together, mm -hmm. and it started with a great concert. One of the neat things for me about going to Berkeley was meeting um, Janet Herman, who did a did a session on Gene Ritchie's music for children, which was a great introduction for me to Jean Ritchie and really who she was. It was right before she died, so it meant a lot to me to have had that acquaintance. So then when I was able to meet John Sakao at Kentucky Music Week, that became very important. And it was neat meeting John because we're both choral people and choral directors, so, so that was a neat connection, one of those neat, unexpected connections you make when you're on the road in this community. You know, last year I've met a lot of people and they say, man, you're just all over the place this year. And I would think, I didn't really feel like I was traveling all that much. But the reason why I felt like I wasn't traveling all that much is because I didn't spend as much of it in the car. I spent all of it really on airplanes. I think I've flown more in the last year than I've flown in the last five. And, and certainly, if you count the amount of the actual amount of hours I spent getting to and from England, I've spent more time in planes than, than probably the last 10 years. You had a kind of an unexpected adventure when the friend asked you if you would drive up to Canada. So tell us a little bit about that experience. My buddy, Tim Cofield, is a, um, is a uh, musician, songwriter, and a videographer. And he called me up uh, just out of the blue um, when I was in Florida, as a matter of fact. He called me up out of the blue and he said, uh, hey, do you want to go to Canada with me and, and, and do some touring? And I said, sure, this was a Friday. And he said, great. Pick me up in Minneapolis on Wednesday. <laughs> and I said, okay, but we're taking your car. <laughs> <laughs> so tons of video equipment and instruments later, mm -hmm. you arrived at the Canadian border. And tell us about that adventure. Yeah, well, it's a 16-hour drive to Minneapolis, so I broke that up over two days. And then there was another six-hour drive on the backside of that to International Falls, which is right at the top of Minnesota to cross into Canada. And we were detained for three hours because they couldn't believe that two guys with musical instruments and twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars worth of video equipment uh, were there on vacation. Right, it doesn't sound <laughs> suspicious at all. Uh, so, tell us about the the people that you met there. Who who were you going to see? What was what was the reason for going? Well, Tim's actually from up there. Tim's from Sioux Falls, which is um, <laughs> he's from Sioux Falls, Ontario, which is in northern Ontario. And um, just north of the town that he grew up in, there are no more roads. <laughs> they just stop. Wow. And, um, uh, and, and we were up there to do a concert in the, uh, at the local VFW, and then we did a house concert. He also, um, we also did those shows with a guy from Edmonton, who's actually originally from Sioux Falls, uh, named Ricky Martin, of all <laughs> things. And he was just an amazing, amazing person. And, and part of the reason why we were there was just so... Um, so that Tim could also do a photo shoot for him kind of as a, as, a, as a favor since he was a bit of a mentor when Tim was younger. Then we went back, uh, having done all of that, we came back to uh, Minneapolis where we did two house concerts because Tim used to have a band in Minneapolis before he moved here to Chattanooga. Okay. And so we actually put the band back together and they did these, uh, these house concerts. And so. Did the folks in Canada, were they familiar with, the, with dulcimer or the instrument? Not but, a clue. Okay, so that was something unique for them yeah. to be able to hear you. Yeah. In fact, there was a guy that came up to me after I had performed, and he he was there when we got let into the place at 4 o'clock, so by the time showtime had rolled roll around, he had a couple. <laughs> and uh, and he sat down next to me, and he, and he leans over, and he says, When you walked in here, I said to myself, there's no way that guy's a musician. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think was meant as a compliment. <laughs> well, yeah, hopefully it proved everybody wrong. Yeah. Um, but anyways, we have great footage of that, so we should look at great. that. That's great. Let's look at it now. Right here in Sioux Lookout, Ontario, Canada, with my man Rick Martin. Butcher Ross and I are up here playing some music in the north. Yeah. And good times. Uh, this is it, huh? It's good Where time. are we, Rick? We are in Sioux Lookout, main line coming right through here, way up north. What clip? What are we on right now? This is part of Sioux Mountain. We're on the foothills of Sioux Mountain. I know my, there, there's a section in the way for a stranger. I know my, <laughs> I know my way is hard and steep. <laughs> it's just right along here that it's, it's a little yeah. bit uh, <laughs> high. So you just, what you do guys is just... I don't want to do no explain to Trish if you fall off. Just lean in, just lean in like that. This ain't so bad. Not so bad? No, I used to okay. roam around rocks like this when I was a kid. Awesome. 
That's awesome. What a really neat adventure that that was. Um, you also got to get on a plane and go to England yeah. this year. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I've been going to England every 18 months or so for a few years now. And one of the reasons why I like to go over there is to meet with the Nonsuch Dulcimer Club. There's one Dulcimer Club for the whole of England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. and really even Ireland. And what does that mean, none such? Is that there's something about that name? That none means? such is an old English folk tune, actually. And okay. That's, that's where it gets its name. And it's a, 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 I don't know much about the song itself, but I do know that, like, you know, there's none such records over there, that, which is a pretty big record label, and a lot of things that sort of come out of that, that name. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that was going on with it, so they meet once a year, and they usually meet in, uh, in a place called Lawn Abbey, which is in Leicestershire, which is a pretty neat place in its own regard. It's an event. There's an organization in Hungary called uh, the Symbolum World Association, and the Symbolum is the Hungarian version of a hammer dulcimer. And this is a worldwide organization for all the instruments that are um, hammer dulcimer-like. So hammer dulcimer, but also the santori or, or the saltieri, uh, you know, or the Symbolum, anything that is that is to be with sticks, you know. And things that might not be familiar to us as Americans per se, you we were able you were able to see kind of this array of instruments from all over the world. Yeah. That related to hammer dulcimer, mountain dulcimer. Unlike the mountain dulcimer, there's some form of a hammer dulcimer everywhere in the world. And what happens with the Congress, what the association does is every two years they meet in a different part of the world and have a worldwide congress of these events. And this year it was being held uh, it was being held in England, in a little town south of Worcester, in Worcestershire, <laughs> right. um, uh, called uh, Great Melbourne. And Great Melbourne is uh, where uh, Elgar uh, lived for a while, C.S. Lewis lived right, there for right. a little while. And it's also where Tolkien was inspired to come up with the concept of Middle Earth. Wow, like this. that's fabulous. So we stayed in Hogwarts, uh, basically. <laughs> <laughs> this building that looked like Hogwarts. And uh, and there were this all of these people from... From all over the world, and what's what? what and this is the reason why I'm going to go. I don't play hammer dulcimer, but the reason why I wanted to go and be a part of, of this thing was because you see these people from all over the world, right? They don't they don't have any common language they can like accept music, right? And so you see all of this amazing stuff happening. So what sometimes we think of it, it being kind of cliche to say music is the international language, but really you saw it firsthand. This yeah, is exactly. exactly what it was. For example, let me sh let me show you this clip real fast. Okay.
So what we saw in that video was a Chinese Yangqing player. That was amazing. Who is from, he's actually, he teaches in Beijing, he's from Western China, he's a Muslim. He was playing with a Taiwanese kid who was playing the cajon, which is a Latin percussion instrument. Right. And when I got back from there, the, one of the news stories I heard on the radio was that the president of China was meeting with the president of Taiwan in Shanghai, and it's the first time that those two countries have had formal meetings, relationships in 60 years. How about that? And these guys didn't care. He was doing something cool. The kid grabbed the box and sat down and started jamming mm -hmm. with them. So that's it. Wow. Here's another one. What we're going to see is we're going to see, um, we're going to see uh, Victoria, who is the head of the Symbol World Association. She actually founded it. And she's playing a symbol. And then you're going to see the, the Chinese guy uh, from playing now a djembe, I believe, or dumbek. She's playing a dumbek. Okay. The uh, Taiwanese kid again. Okay. And uh, and then a um, an, an English uh, guy as well who's playing the djembe, which is a Middle Eastern percussion instrument. And you got to watch what happens between the between the two. Victoria is actually leading the band by the way that she plays, and okay. she can't see them, and they can't see her. She's right. not conducting with her face. Mm -hmm. She's conducting with just with just the music. Hmm. It's really incredible. Right. Let's take a look. glad that you got to have that amazing experience. It's really an example of how music really does bring us together. And just another example of how we meet people on the road that are so enriching to our lives. Amazing. It really is great. We had a great time over the holidays. And one of the most fun things that we did, at least for me, was doing our first ever Butch and Trish Very Merry webcast. Mm -hmm. We did it live on Concert Window, and we invited bass player Dave Schwab and guitarist Hera Paver to be our guests. Mm -hmm. And one of the most fun things about that concert, although Concert Window concerts are occasionally and often done without an audience, is that we invited a live studio audience to be <laughs> a part of it, and yeah, I so think everybody a, had a good time. I thought it was great. Uh, you know, again... I've seen, you know, Steve and, and Bing and Steve Yulberg all do um, how, you know, concert window events, and, and they're a lot of they're a lot of fun. But I, I yeah. just personally knew it would be I would be better if there were people in the room. Right, so me too. We invited some friends over, did it like a little Roger Williams house concert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was like my personal Perry Como moment. And so 
We had so much fun that we are planning on doing another one. And this live concert window experience will be Trish and Butch's St. Patty's Day Spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to do that on Tuesday, March the 15th. Mm -hmm. Like before, it's going to be a live webcast with the studio, uh, with a house concert uh, audience. We're going to invite um, some, there's some pretty good, well, the great Irish musicians here in town, and so we're going to invite some of them over to do a couple of tunes with us. Yeah, so I only wish my grandmother and grandfather could be around to see this, because they were, they were um, very proud of my grandfather's Irish heritage. <laughs> so this will be a lot of fun for us, so I hope you'll join us, and we'll tell you more about that on our Facebook and online. And of course, the last thing I want to talk about uh, on this particular uh, episode is something that didn't happen last year, but actually happened just a, just a few days ago. And that, of course, would be Kentucky Winter Weekend. And Kentucky Winter Weekend is, I would describe it as a mini Kentucky Music Week. There's tons of classes to be taken over the weekend. They're all kind of um, uh, packed into this really fun and educational weekend. And there's some great concerts that go along with that. One of them was one of the most collaborative concerts I think I've ever seen um, at a festival. And people like Andy Young and Dave Haas and Rick Thumb and Steve Seifert and uh, Kat, Kathy and Dave. Dave, Kathy Barton and Dave Hearn, yeah. Right, we're all, all a part of this. And, I, and the way that everyone played music with each other was very special. Butch was able to end the concert with one of the Beatles tunes that I think he plays tremendously well and is always a crowd pleaser and I'd love to show you that video now. <laughs>
Well, thank you for sticking with us thus far through the episode. This part of the show is going to be the part where we take um, letters, answer questions, and things like that. Of course, we don't have any of those yet, so we can't really do that right now. But as we said before, like us on Facebook, make comments on the web page, on the YouTube page, send us uh, an email, uh, dulcimerroad at gmail.com, with your questions or your comments or things you'd like to see, suggestions and ideas. And uh, especially with the questions, we'll take care of them right here. There can be about anything dulcimer related, and if I can't answer them, I'll find somebody who will. Well, that's it for our first episode. Thank you so much for joining us. We've had a great time, and I hope you did too. We'll be back around the same time every month with another episode of Dulcimer Road. We're going to leave you today with Ella's, her daughter Ella's, uh, debut as a dulcimer player. Here she is at the Signal Mountain Presbyterian Church Christmas Fest playing uh, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. Thanks again for watching. Please do subscribe, and we will see you on the road.